please welcome to the stage Alan Little, Justin Maroxi and Bayan Brahman to discuss Baghdad, City of Peace, City of Blood. Thanks very much. Great to be back here. Nice to see some old faced old friends in the audience as well. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a, a partly about this amazing book, uh -huh. Baghdad, City of Peace, City of Blood, that Justin has written. I was saying to him before we came in, I wish I'd had this book to read in 1990, the first time I went to Baghdad. It makes me realize how ignorant, really, we all were about the city and its background when, uh, when it burst onto the, it, it, into the international news uh, in 1990 in the way that it did. Um, but first of all, I want to talk to Bayan Rahman, who's the Kurdistan Regional Government High Representative to the United Kingdom, because the situation now in Iraq and Syria, and especially in uh, Kurdistan, is extremely acute. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about to, to, to Bayan first, and then talk to Justin about the, about the roots of that. Bayan, how would you describe the situation that uh, people in, in that part of um, Iraq and Syria are facing now? Well, we're describing it as, as genocide. Uh, what the Islamic State are committing is targeted killings. They separate the men from the women. They kill the men. Uh, the women have been taken in their hundreds to uh, places in Mosul where they're being used for sex. And they've also kidnapped children for the same purpose. Uh, the people who've been targeted are Yazidis who uh, are neither Christian nor Muslim. So they don't get the choice to uh, pay tax. Where they overrun Christian villages, the villagers are given three choices, convert to Islam, pay a tax, or run away, or die. So at least the Christians are given one extra choice. If you're a Yazidi, there is no choice. You either convert or you die. They're clearly targeting these people for their religion, the Christians, the Yazidis, but there are others as well, the Shabaks, the Kakais. These are very small sects. The level of barbarity, and I'm talking about Iraq, which has a history of barbarity, but the level of barbarity that we're seeing today is just beyond comprehension. They are killing people, murdering people in the worst possible ways. The women who have been taken uh, into sexual slavery, some of them have mobile phones and have been able to phone their families secretly. And the things they're describing are incredible. They're saying that they want to be killed. They would rather be dead than to be going through these repeated rapes. It's very noticeable for us Kurds that we are again going through another genocide. You know, about three years ago, and, and Mark Muller and Brian Brivati have been very involved in this, about three years ago, we launched a campaign in the UK to raise awareness of the Kurdish genocide. So many people said to me, why are you bothering? That was in the past. We were talking about the chemical attack on Halabja in 1988, the Anfal genocide campaign in which Saddam killed 182,000 people. The killing of the Barzanis, 8,000 men and boys in 1983 disappeared from that tribe. The killing of the Faili Kurds, they are Kurds who are Shia by Saddam Hussein. These all happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and people were asking us, why are you trying to raise aware awareness of these genocides now? Well, many reasons. One is justice, recognition, compensation. But also, we Kurds, we don't feel we're out of the threat of genocide. We have always felt that genocide is around the corner for us, and we're seeing it today. And according to the 1948 Genocide Convention, where there is a genocide, there has to be intervention. You have to intervene. It's everybody's responsibility. There are other, I'm sure there are learned lawyers here who can say much more about that. If I may, before we move on, just read you part of an email from a colleague and a friend. He's actually a documentary maker. You may have heard of him, Gwyn Roberts. His documentaries have won many awards, including an Emmy Award. He is right now around Mosul, around the Kurdish refugee camps, collecting testimony from the victims of ISIS. And I'll just read you a, some, a short passage from his email.
He says, the, the situation is very horrible, pretty horrible. We've been filming a lot at a Yazidi camp, just a few kilometers from ISIS-held territory. They're separated from their murderers by a stretch of water, which I cannot believe. It's extraordinary that these, two, these poor people have walked 200 kilometers to escape these barbaric Islamists, only to end up in a camp so near their front line. The stories they tell quickly become the norm. Mass ex execution of men and boys, abductions of the female population. We've, to we've interviewed a number of people who tell similar experiences. They feign death and lie for hours under the corpses of their fellow villagers and then flee under cover of darkness, even though they're very badly wounded. All those who died had refused to convert to Islam and were then slaughtered like animals. This is happening today, right now, as we speak in Iraq, the capital of which is Baghdad. What, do, you, do you find resistance in the Western democracies to embrace the word genocide, the G word you called it earlier? Yes, it's been very noticeable that in the, even though the West has responded very quickly, and I have to say Britain was among the first to respond with humanitarian assistance. When you look at the statements that come out, they avoid the G word, the word genocide, because there are obligations involved in that. Uh, the EU foreign ministers had an, an important meeting last week where they discussed the Ukraine and Iraq. They, they expressed a lot of support for the people of Iraq and that they would try to intervene militarily in, in, in a humanitarian way. But they just avoided, it was very clear that the wording had been chosen very carefully so that they could avoid the word genocide. However, I noted the other day that when President Obama spoke about uh, James Foley's murder by ISIS. He said ISIS had ambitions to commit genocide. It's the first time he has used the word genocide in this case. But not yet an acknowledgement that they already are. Exactly, exactly. But it is genocide. And the thing is that we Kurds are those of us who are abroad and we have time to think, I'm not in the middle of battle, I'm thinking, well, how do we get the proof now? Well, how do we collect the evidence while it's there? The problem we've had with recognition of the genocide in the 80s and 70s, it's so long ago, so many people have died that could have given testimony. This is a live genocide, if I can use that strange terminology. How do we gather the evidence today so that these people don't escape justice. Okay, you, you said Britain was one of the first to respond with humanitarian aid. We'll speak in a bit in a, in a minute about whether a humanitarian response is sufficient, because often a humanitarian response to a conflict can have the effect at, of prolonging the conflict without really changing its outcome. Uh, but Justin, you've spent much of the last decade in Iraq, living there for long periods. Um, ISIS now control a, a stretch of territory probably larger than the United Kingdom. Uh, how did this happen? What, what was the catastrophe in Mosul that, that, um, that, that led to this? I think it's an extraordinary breakdown, or it, it, almost in slow motion, of, of the Iraqi state, although, although we, aren't, we aren't there yet. What, what it, what, is, that, is that me making that noise or someone else? Um, it remi reminds me a little bit of the, the, the Ottoman period when, when what we now call Iraq created um, in 1921 or the borders created in 1921 by the Brits was three Ottoman vilayets or provinces. Mosul in the north with a, with a, a more Kurdish population, speaking you know, roughly. In the south, uh, in the middle rather, Baghdad, um, lots of Sunnis, and then further south, the, the, the vilayet of Basra. Um, there have been historical problems between, with, between those, those three groups, those three regions. Um, under Saddam Hussein, a little, uh, in the part of the world that you're especially familiar with, Alan, in, in, the, in the Balkans, um, makes me think, you know, the removal of Milosevic, a, a sort of lid came, lid, a lid came off, um, and very ancient antagonisms were able to express themselves freely. I've had lots of, lots of discussions with Iraqis who say, oh, you know, you Americans, you Brits, before, before you came in 2003, we didn't have a Sunni and Shia. I didn't know you were a Shia. You, you know, my neighbor was a Sunni. I never knew that. You know, this is something created by the West. And I think that's, although the invasion of 2003 exacerbated those tensions, 
Um, <laughs> yeah, clearly. Sorry, we're talking about Iraq. I, inevitably, there has to be gun noises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mortar fire in the background. Um, but this, but this is a, seems to be a, a different order of things. Who, who are ISIS? How much support have they got among the Sunni well, when population? I first, when, when I first went to Iraq in 2004, a lot later than you, um, we called it Al-Qaeda al in Iraq. Mm. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was cutting off heads with, with gusto, you know, be beheadings, um, well, journalists, contractors, and so on. They've since morphed into various other groups. They've had... Um, but we thought they were finished in 2007, 2008, didn't we? Yes, we did, um, with, the, with the awakening. Um, General Petraeus and the surge, um, but I think what the possible parallels between then and now, we, we, if there are any grounds to be optimistic, and I think there, there, are, there are precious few, but a wedge was driven between the foreign fighters and Iraqis. People in, in, in Fallujah, the Mali, west of Baghdad, have no interest in li li living in the sort of ISIS, Al-Qaeda state, um, where they're more interested in cutting off heads and distributing Qurans at traffic lights than actually governing the region that they purport to control. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing we haven't mentioned is Maliki, who, to, to, you know, in my mind has been an abject failure as, as a prime minister, incredibly divisive, uh, fueling this, these sectarian divisions we've been discussing between Sunni and Shia, taking upon himself the portfolio of defense, national security, interior. Uh, at least one of those was traditionally reserved for a, a Sunni leader. Um, so we, we, he can't escape a lot of the blame for, for what's happened now. And, and when, when, you, when, when you, you, know, you refer to Mosul falling to ISIS, why did the Iraqi army not put up a fight? A lot of them just, just, just simply you know, fled the scene. They, they had no interest in propping up a state that has come to be identified with this corrupt, venal, sectarian leader in Baghdad. And what pictures have come out of ISIS-controlled territory? The, it does seem that there is a measure of popular support for ISIS, among, especially among the men, and the young men in particular. Is it true? Is there a basis of popular support for them? I mean, I, I, I personally haven't come across that, but I, I'm sure, sure there is in, in, in places. But I think these things are often very temporary as well. It, you know, it reminds me when, when the, the, the stories of people putting flowers into American M4 rifles um, in Baghdad. Uh, by all, that was in April. By August, uh, the first major Al-Qaeda bomb against the UN headquarters. Yeah. And you know, the public opinion turned very quickly hostile to the. Um, but I was there in April, even when those pictures were coming out, and already you could feel the undertow yeah. of hostility. It you was know, there almost from the first day. You have those sort of feelings of liberation, and very yeah. quickly no. turning against. I mean, I, 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 I think ISIS is is is, is going to be a relatively short-lived phenomenon. Let's talk about policy options in the meantime. Then, uh, uh, Bayan, what what should the Western democracies be doing in in in, in an ideal world for you? Well, right now, uh, we are getting humanitarian assistance and we're getting military assistance. But it really needs to be stepped up. This is a humanitarian disaster on the worst possible scale. The UN has given it its th number three rating, which is the highest or worst rating for a humanitarian crisis. So it has to be uh, coordinated. Uh, done with force and speed, both the humanitarian assistance and the military assistance. Uh, the airstrikes by the United States have been effective. They have enabled the Kurdish army, the Peshmerga, to retake some of the villages and, crucially, with the Iraqi army as well, to retake the Mosul Dam. So we but need Mosul more itself? Do we need to read? Does the Western powers need to help the Peshmerga retake Mosul? I think we do need to take retake Mosul, but that's a different ball game. It's a city. It's uh, but symbolically, it's extremely important. It's the second largest city in Iraq, and historically, it's been a historic, cultural, trading hub. So we do have to take back Mosul. But for now, the dam, at least, which is a key piece of infrastructure that could have flooded entire populations in Baghdad and Mosul has, is now in safer hands. But the military response, we're not asking for boots on the ground. We have our own boots on the ground. But the problem is, going back to what you were saying about Maliki, one of Maliki's policies was to ensure that none of the American equipment, military equipment, reached the Kurdish Peshmerga. So today, our Peshmerga are fighting this incredibly savage terrorist organization that has the latest American Humvees. And I've been told these Humvees, is, is that all right? Yeah. They're really like tanks. I mean, they're tanks. We have no anti-tank missiles. We just have Kalashnikovs. 
and you know they come in suicidal waves so when they attack it's not like a normal army where the soldier wants to preserve his life they come in waves of suicidal attacks followed by whatever else they can throw at us so we need a military response that can match that and that means delivering equipment weaponry to the Kurdish forces and providing some training to go with it. Justin, do you agree with that? The, the, the caution I have, I suppose, on, on intervention is the, go, go, again, going back to 2003, and I, I, I went as a, as a, as an idealist in 2004 thinking anything has got to be better than Saddam Hussein, and I think I was completely wrong. And the last 10 years, more now, have been the, the levels of bloodshed that have been spilt since 2003 to me render that intervention a complete failure um, and possibly morally unacceptable as well. We wanted to do it for the right reasons. You know, Saddam, a brutal dictator, and perhaps if we have time a little bit later, I'm going to read it. Uh, well, that wasn't really the reason, was it? It was weapons of mass destruction. That was the reason. Uh, not unrelated to a bit of oil reserves as well, probably as well. Um, the Kurds now are in a desperate state, as Ban has been outlining. Um, I think the humanitarian intervention has been, has been you know, entirely um, the right thing to do. But there are a lot of people and a lot of hawks who want much more than that. I don't think you're going to bomb Iraq into stability um, from the air. And then, then uh, although you have said, um, Bayan, you don't want boots on the ground, or you have boots on the ground, there, there are plenty of people who want to put more Western boots on the ground. And I, I think if we haven't learned from the mistakes of the past decade, we, we, we've got incredibly poor memories. But what about Bayan's point that you, you, you the, the Peshmerga need to have at least a, 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 the means, the, the military hardware, to resist well, further advances? I think Bayan's completely right that the, the ISIS are suddenly, you know, their coffers are, 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 are swollen with supposedly $2 billion they acquired from the, the central bank in Mosul, plus a lot of the Iraqi army equipment, Humvees, and, and, and more than that. Um, yes, but. Uh, by all means, sub start supplying the Peshmerga with, with, with heavier weaponry. But beware of the, those two words, mission creep. Let's talk a bit about uh, the city of Baghdad and, and, and this book. Bayan, you were born in Baghdad. Uh, yes, I'm Kurdish, but I was born in Baghdad. Uh, if I can just give you a little bit of history as to why I was born in Baghdad, it'll tell you a bit of my experience of the city. Uh, my father was in the leadership of the Kurdish movement against the Ba'athist fascist regime in Baghdad. Um, he was in hiding in Kurdistan and my mother fell pregnant and uh, my father was constantly on the run so it was impossible for a heavily pregnant woman to be following him around. So she went to Baghdad where my grandparents lived. Um, so I was born there and my memories of Baghdad as a child are very mixed. On the one hand, I had a very happy childhood, uh, two brothers and a sister. My grandparents lived next door to us, so it was a wonderful, massive, extended family and a lot of affection and so on. But also Baghdad for me uh, is the city where my mother and father were sentenced to death in absentia by Saddam's court. It's the city of, the, of my oppressors, my people's oppressors, not just Saddam Hussein. Ever since then, Maliki wasn't that much better. Maliki would have become another Saddam, giving, given him another few years. So my, my view of Baghdad is very mixed. On the one hand, I have very happy childhood memories, and I know that it has a very rich history, but as a Kurd, you can't help, help but look to Baghdad as the, the seat of your oppressors. This is where they get their power from. But in those years between the rise of Saddam Hussein and the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, it was a very, as, a, as you say, mixed, very split city in the sense of my earliest impression in, when I went there in 1990, shortly after the invasion of Kuwait, it was a, a, a city that was very open to the world. Every other Iraqi you met had a PhD from Harvard or Edinburgh. Um, it's, there, it was highly educated, highly urbane, a very, very strong professional middle class, which is the basis of any civil society that's possible. But at the same time, it had this tremendous history of brutality and fear. And uh, Justin, I know you want to read a, a bit from your, from your book about the way in which the Saddam yeah, regime uh, used fear as, as a means of coercion and control. Uh, the, the reason I, I wanted to really was to pick up from that, from that first session um, with the panel we're talking about the importance of testimony, um, torture, and human rights. Um, 
I should warn you, it, it's a fairly unpleasant piece of uh, dis description of, of what Saddam's torture apparatus was like in practice. Saddam's torturers in Baghdad lacked neither imagination nor zeal for the task at hand. Professionally trained in tried and tested techniques by East German and Soviet intelligence and secret service advisors, they inflicted pain on their fellow Iraqis through myriad mind-fogging methods, many of them recorded in a, in a collection of videos kept by the Saddam Special Treatment Department. In one, a man is filmed tied to a chair, screwed to the floor. Which one? This is my mic that's bang, banging around in my pocket, is it? Is, it, is, is, is that banging coming from us? <coughs> yes, uh, Should I just use the um, affordable mic, maybe? Would that be easier? This never happens on Newsnight. Service resume. Thank you. Um, in, in one of the videos, a man is filmed tied to a chair, screwed to the floor, huge crocodile clips attached to his nipples and genitals. His body twitches and shakes as the electric current is delivered. His eyes pop. Saliva foams from his mouth. The camera zooms in on his contorted face. He screams and screams. Some victims have their arms and legs amputated with an electric saw or an axe. Their mouths prized apart until their jaws break. Their skin branded with iron skewers. Their noses broken with heavy hammers. Fingernails and toenails pulled out with pliers. A wiry man is tied naked to a gas ring, which is then turned on and burns through his skin. One man stands by a wall with his head sandwiched between two wooden wedges to which his ears are nailed. When he can no longer stand, he slumps to the floor and his ears are ripped off. Teeth are drilled. The corpses of murdered victims are thrown into cells to decompose in the heat of a Baghdad summer. Snarling fighting dogs, Rottweilers and Dobermans are thrust into cells to attack men already weak from torture. Women are raped before husbands. Glass bottles are shoved into men's anuses. A menstruating woman is hung upside down by her feet. Wires are plunged into flesh and so on and so forth. In all the terrible history of death and violence in Baghdad, there had been nothing as perverted as this. Um, and that, that's just a, a snapshot of what was happening behind closed doors for the 23 odd years that, that Saddam was ruling around 79 to 2003. And one of the things that happened between 1990 and 2003, and that's the period when I used to go to Iraq, and then you, you've been going from 2004 until last year, really, uh, we, we could see this, the slow, steady, gradual degradation of the urban middle class in Iraq. There's yeah. nothing. You know, the, the, you see it very graphically with, with you, watching a, a, a professor of astrophysics standing at the side of the road selling his textbooks, and other. Uh, and you describe this in this book in order to put food on the, the on the on the table of his family, and you see this, the the loss of the loss of status, the loss of professional expertise, and gradually with each year that passes, there is nobody left who went to Harvard or Edinburgh or the LSE, yeah. and those connections with the outside world are being lost among the. Among the for a quarter of a century now, among the urban middle class, that's been a that has been a, a, a byproduct of the of the of Western policy towards, or a direct result of Western policy towards Iraq, hasn't it? Yeah, and I, I and the, and the tragedy is that it's a reversal of what Baghdad used to be. Um, obviously, we're talking about contemporary Baghdad and the the, the crisis and genocide in Kurdistan. Um, but for the first five hundred years of Baghdad's history, in um, from seven sixty to twelve fifty eight, when Hulagu comes in and destroys it. Baghdad is really the world's capital. Cultural, intellectual, um, scientific, uh, great discoveries are being made in science, mathematics, medicine, astronomy. The wisdom of the ancient Greeks uh, coming from Byzantium, translated into Arabic, um, refined, improved, sent across the Islamic empire. And Baghdad, is, there's, a, there's a brain drain from Central Asia um, to the east, um, the Atlantic in the west, to Baghdad. So what, what you're describing, Alan, is absolutely right. The, sort of the evisceration of the middle classes, the intelligentsia, 
when I arrived in 2004, lecturers were being assassinated by Al-Qaeda, musicians, poets, writers, journalists, all, all, and all were heading for the exit door, which is you know, completely ghastly for, for those who remain um, the future of Iraq's political and cultural life. Tell us about some of the people you got to know in Iraq in, in, in your decade. There. I mean, we, had a, we employed a man as a sort of local fixer to run the BBC office. It was way, way below his station in life. And he was a James Joyce scholar. He wrote his PhD in Arabic at the University of Baghdad on James Joyce. And he translated Ulysses into Arabic. And uh, he had a young family. And in the, 1990, in the 1980s, he thought that would be his career. And he spent his life traveling around the Western world, going to James Joyce and Irish literature conferences around the world. And it was all ended on that day, 2nd of August, uh, 1990 by the invasion of Kuwait. I asked him about how he'd managed to translate James, uh, Ulysses into Arabic and he said, first of all, I had to translate it into English. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to know people like that. I suppose, yeah, my equivalent of that would be the man to whom this book is dedicated, uh, Manaf al-Damluji, who, who, who represents so much of what, what's you know, greatest about Iraq, an incredibly cultured, civilised man, um, Anglophile, Anglophile to the point of, of, um, of madness, really. Loves all old British cars, Shakespeare, um, takes an incredible interest in, in, in British life in all its aspects. He now lives in Amarillo, Texas, um, hounded out of Baghdad. I mean, it's an incredibly weird place for someone like that to end up. Uh, someone who once sent me a, C a CD by a French composer I'd never heard of, Boal Dieu, I think a Baroque composer. Um, typically, um, from that, I suppose, a very small stratum of, of Iraqi society, old-fashioned Sunni aristocrat, um, but now living in exile in Amarillo, Texas, after he and his wife were really badly beaten up by thugs, probably not Al-Qaeda, uh, just in the lawlessness that, that followed the, the invasion in 2003. And my best friend, um, Iraqi, coming to visit next week. Um, just desperate to leave the country. And he said to me the other day, something just has always stayed in my, my, my mind ever since. He just said, Iraqis, and this was before ISIS, so a few months ago, Iraqis have no hope for the future, he said. His, his um, brother is doing a PhD in Sheffield, engineering, you know, another sort of classic ir Iraqi um, middle class. But won't go back. I, I, why would he go back? Why would he want to go back? And, and I'll probably try and encourage my friend next week to, to get the hell out. Um, it's too dangerous. Bayan, let me ask you a personal question. Your brother and father uh, were killed in a suicide bombing. Apart from the obvious personal tragedy and grief of it, it changed your life, really, didn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, I think I was heading in a certain direction anyway, but uh, it brought it all around much more quickly. Um, I mentioned earlier that my mother and father were sentenced to death in absentia. As a result, we ended up becoming uh, refugees in the UK. And I have to say, in the 70s, Britain was much more generous to people seeking as asylum. Some of the debate that I hear today about asylum seekers absolutely makes me furious. So anyway, we came here in the 70s. Uh, my father didn't really stay. He went back to continue the struggle, but I ended up growing up in Chislehurst in Kent, going to a grammar school, and I went to Goldsmiths uh, College, University of London, and uh, eventually I became a journalist. So uh, I worked as a journalist for 17 years, including a while as a Tokyo correspondent for the Financial Times. But I have to say, I think th coming from the background that I did, um, I often thought, why aren't I working directly to do something for my people, to, to do something for Kurdistan. And I think I was thinking more and more about leaving journalism and perhaps going to work with my father because by 1999, my father was a deputy prime minister of the Kurdistan region. And we had a government in the Kurdistan region. Um, if you want, I can go into that later. But basically, from 1992, we were able to establish in Kurdistan region, a Kurdish parliament, a Kurdish government, and so on. So uh, after several years in journalism, I was thinking about going into politics, and but public service, really, to, to help the Kurdish people to do whatever I could. 
And I was having conversations with my father by telephone from Tokyo to Kurdistan, saying, you know, I'm thinking about this, what can I do? My Kurdish is very rusty and so on. And before we could really go much further, uh, one Sunday afternoon I was out with my sister and some friends in Tokyo and a friend called and said, your father's been killed uh, in a suicide bombing. And for me that just decided everything for me, that uh, I need to go to Kurdistan and I need to be with my people, with my family, and I need to offer whatever, whatever I can offer. And at that point I didn't really know what I could. And so anyway, I've ended up being the representative to the UK and inflicting myself on you today. <laughs> Let me ask you, I want to ask one more thing before I throw it open to the audience. Um, when we were in Kuwait in 2003 waiting for the invasion to, to start, we, a lot of us were struck by the parallels with the British invasion of Mesopotamia during the First World War. Um, at this, because, because there as well the British message to the local Arab population was we're coming as liberators to free you from the Turkish oppressor. Uh, they dropped leaflets just as they dropped leaflets in 2003. Um, you talk about this, this um, extensively in the book. Are you struck by the parallels? Oh, they, I think they're, they're extraordinary. This, even, even down to the, sort of the rhetoric um, in the run-up to the invasion in 2003. There's, there's a letter, Gertrude Bell, who's the Sir Percy Cox, the High Commissioner, uh, she's his Oriental Secretary, and she's writing letters back to her father. Um, in, and in 1917, as General Maud's troops ride into Baghdad, she says, we shall, I trust, make it a great center of, of, of civilization and, and prosperity. And there's this feeling that, you know, the, the Brits are in town, we're going to make this um, a great, a great um, city again, you know, back to the glory days of the Abbasids and all, so, and all sorts of guff like that. And then within, within a, a couple of years, Iraq is in nationwide um, jihad, meltdown, rebellion, um, and, you know, and heads are being cut off again. And the, the hated invader is, uh, you know, there is a, that being resisted again. One of the most poignant places I've been to in my whole life is that uh, British and Commonwealth war grave in Baghdad. Hundreds, possibly thousands of British and Commonwealth war graves there. It's the same design as the war graves in Flanders and northern France those Portland stone um, uh, headstones, but it's the color, the color of the desert rather than green. Is it still there? There are several. The one, the one I'm thinking of is Baghdad North Gate. The one um, with General cemetery, Maud. With General Maud. And there's a very evocative memorial to the fallen from Kut. Yeah. Um, and after that siege, in which about, I think, 23,000 largely Indian um, uh, soldiers died with, with, the, with the British Army, um, were forced to march. The survivors were forced to march to Anatolia, and it became known as the Death March. And they were uh, they were the those who were straggling back across the desert to Turkey were either bullied, uh, burgled, beaten, buggered to death. And there's a little memorial with the words, "These are they who came out of great tribulation um, in the, in that cemetery," which was pretty shattered when I visited it. And there'd been mortars had been landing there. A lot of the gravestones had been blown up. But the, um, the War Graves um, Commission said it, you know, it is doing as much as it can to maintain that yeah. site. Well, I went in April 2003, and it was an amazing time to be there because it was Paul Bremer still hadn't arrived in Baghdad. He still wasn't there. It was the height of the looting, and people were beginning to say, well, everything, if everything has been looted, where are the weapons of mass destruction? Because surely they've been looted as well. Um, and you just had to go to that great, that Commonwealth war grave, and, and you thought, well, this is what happened almost a century ago, and you can already feel the undertow, even in the first few days when the, after the statue came down, you could feel the undertow of hostility to the Americans in the air. So it was kind of foreseeable, wasn't it? Well, you know, you, you mentioned Bremer, and um, I always thought it was staggering when it, to, to hear that he didn't have a single Arabist on his staff. That th These were sort of Republican supporters, ideologues, neocons, Daddy might have been a big sponsor back in Washington, give you a job in Baghdad. Um, and this is a tremendously complicated society. Um, so to, just to sort of w wade in and talk about, talk about privatizing the shit out of everything, and we'll have capital markets, and we'll issue bonds, and all these sorts of things, in someone else's country, under occupation, was, was, was staggering, really. And Bremer's year, I think, was, was a fiasco, really. I remember going up to Umm Qasr, which is on the Kuwait, Kuwait Iraq border in Iraq, and Jeff Hoon had said in Parliament that Umm Qasr was a, uh, 
uh, a coastal port city on the on the south coast of Iraq, a bit like Southampton. <laughs> and one of the British soldiers there said, either he's never been to Umkasa or he's never been to Southampton. <laughs> um, let's get some questions from the audience. Yes, gentlemen there. There's a microphone. Can you just wait for the microphone to get to you? Thank you. Uh, I lived in Kuwait for a year in 1970, and the Kuwaitis were very happy to be Americanized and have the Western influence and the money and the oil and all of that. But they also were very resentful about not being able to um, demonstrate and use their Arab culture, if you like. Uh, to what extent do you think the current problems are caused by the West drawing the maps and imposing the culture of the West on those regions that you're talking about? I think the drawing of the maps is uh, definitely responsible for what's happening. Iraq is a false state, uh, deliberately splitting the Kurds between four countries, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, uh, was a British and French policy. Uh, putting Shias and Sunnis together when they have centuries of war and uh, resentment against each other. So Iraq really is a failed state because it should never have been drawn into that shape in the first place. Um, I'm not sure about imposing Western culture. I, I would say what I see of, of Iraq, most of my travels are in the Kurdistan region, but I do sometimes venture further south. I think Iraqi, Arab and Kurdish and Assyrian, Turkoman, Yazidi culture is very strong. But young people today interested in iPads, iPhones, um, they watch satellite television and they want the same Ferrari as someone else is driving. And uh, so in a way there is that form of globalization going on. But I, I feel personally that uh, the local culture is very strong there. Justin, what about those borders? You talk about that as well in the book. Okay, can I just begin, begin in answering that, just draw a, a quick parallel with um, David Cameron, who is struggling to preserve the union at the moment. Um, compare his predicament with that of the Iraqi Prime Minister now, who presides over what Biden has just called a failed state. That those borders are British. You know, um, Gertrude Bell said Percy Cox, even Lawrence involved in some of that. Um, and, and now breaking up, tragically. So, and in terms of the imposing Western culture, possibly in that year we just referred back to with Bremer, um, free markets, democracy, as though it would just be introduced like that at the barrel of an M4 and an Abraham's tank. Um, I think what's, what's been left in terms of a democracy is actually a, a, a sectarian a kleptocracy in Baghdad that doesn't really owe much to any sort of democracy that we might think of. Well, the British imposed a monarchy after the First World War. Yeah, the Brits, Brits, Brits loved a monarchy, so, so we, we, we thought that was best for Iraqis. Um, well, that, was the, that was the neocon project of its day. It, was, it? it lasted 37 years. It wasn't too bad, actually. And you talk to, talk to Iraqis of a certain age, who I have hastened to add, older than, older than Bayan, who go a little bit misty-eyed there when they talk about the 1950s. And they say, oh, those were the good old days. You know, Baghdad was being redeveloped, new cinemas, opera. Arnold Toynbee visiting, giving lectures, uh, Stephen Runciman, and this was a time when Baghdad was back on the world stage again. Well, and then even the, when I knew it at first in 1990, it was full of s Swedish engineers and uh, Irish nurses and uh, Italian playboys. I mean, it was a very international city. It felt very open to the world, so you can understand why yeah, absolutely. Pe people feel nostalgic. And what about the imposition of Western values? What do you make of that? Uh, on the I'm I talking about the um, I, I, only up to point. I, I think in that in that in that one ghastly year under under Paul Bremer um, of of saying let, let let's have free markets, privatize everything inside, um, and and you can have democracy now because we say so. Any other questions from the yes? You, the microphone's coming. Thank you. Thank you. I understand the case for parity of weaponry, but parity of weaponry and the war that follows and changes balance a little along the way is only a mechanism. A mechanism to what? I mean, is, is a political, social, cultural solution possible here? What well, has to go alongside the, 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 the military? It's, it's certainly sure. not a, a reversion to status quo ante with Maliki. And sure. Well, I mean, we're working on three fronts, really, on the humanitarian front, the military front, and the political front. Um, in the past mon month or so, we have a new president, Fouad Matsoum, for Iraq. We have a new prime minister, 
uh, even though P Prime Minister Maliki tried to cling on uh, and use, ironically use the constitution to try to challenge the new prime minister. And this is, Maliki is the man who has ridden roughshod over the Iraqi constitution. Nevertheless, this is, the opportunity for us is there. We have new president, new prime minister in Iraq. Even though the new prime minister is from the same party as Maliki, shares a lot of his views. Um, colleagues who are Kurdish members of parliament in Baghdad who know him, say that he's very anti-Kurdish, for example. He will listen to Iran. He uh, is, is it, it'll be a surprise if he can really bring Iraq together. But it's better than having Maliki because Maliki was a definite failure. So at least there is an opportunity. In the long term, how will Iraq go ahead? Either it's going to disintegrate completely and in a terrible way, not in any organized sort of form of disintegration that perhaps the UK is heading for or perhaps not. It'll be chaos, bloodshed, it'll be terrible. The best case scenario that I can see is that Iraq stays together as one country with a very loose confederation. So you would have the Kurdistan region, a Sunni, Sunnistan region, and then the Shia parts of Iraq, where but except it's that Baghdad under local is all, government. You say a Sunnistan region around Baghdad, but, but, but Baghdad is substantially a, a Shia city now. Yeah, it is. I mean, what, one, the lots of ideas were thrown around uh, immediately after 2003. One idea, which is being mentioned again, is five regions. So a Kurdish region, a Sunni region, two Shia regions in the south, and Baghdad to be treated as a sort of a one-off region by itself. But it has to be a very, very loose confederation. And it's been proven, even in the chaos that we've had over the past 10 years, wherever local government has been strong in Iraq, there's been less corruption, more accountability. And I think that's the only way to keep Iraq together. Justin, you must have witnessed this over the 10 years that you were there, this separation of Sunni and Shia in Baghdad. Yeah, and the, 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 sort of the, the internal map within the city being redrawn. And there's some very good, um, I forget which American university it is now, but have published these, these visual graphics of, of Baghdad pre-2003, and then almost year by year. And you see the sort of progressive cantonization of the city into largely Sunni, almost, almost exclusively Sunni, Shia, Sunni areas and almost exclusively Shia areas. Far less mixed population. Um, and going back to you know, Baghdad as a great cosmopolitan city, the other thing we should mention is the, the hounding into extinction of the Jewish community. Uh, only 100 years ago, 35 to 40 percent of Baghdad was Jewish, which is sort of, you know, an astonishing figure. And then the Christian community. Um, Canon Andrew White, who became a great friend in, in Iraq while I was there, so, you know, his, his flock has been decimated in, in recent years, the vicar of Baghdad. So the, the, the era of multi-faith Baghdad seems to be coming to an end, which is also very tragic, because when you get the, the, the thugs from ISIS, or IS as they're called now, talking about restoring the Islamic Caliphate, what they never tell you is that the Jews and the Christians played a very important role during those, those great centuries. When, when Baghdad was this cultural and intellectual metropolis. And do you, do you agree with Bayan that uh, the future is for some sort of cantonized Iraq? I, I completely agree when Bayan was talking about um, loose federation, because that is common sense. But the, the, the problem is every single Iraqi political leader who comes adopts a winner-takes-all iron grip. And I, again, I completely agree with Bayan what, what you said about um, Maliki becoming another Saddam. Absolutely, that he was on his way to doing that. He'd adopted the same techniques for, of taking power over all the uh, intelligence and security um, apparatus. W will, will Mr. Alabadi be any different? And um, do we have another question from the floor? Yeah, there's a question down here and then one further back. Hello. I understand the need to arm Kurdish forces. I was wondering, uh, with the arms companies being maybe the side they're on might be a profit, how the ISIS was armed, uh, you know, with the, these vehicles. I might be ignorant in my ignorance here, that's why I'm asking the question. How the West came, was it, you know, how these weapons came from the West to arm ISIS. How, how, what do we know about how ISIS was armed? Well, uh, we know that when they took over Mosul, uh, the Iraqi army really melted away, and the, we need to investigate why that was. Was it deliberate or just panic? Uh, but when they melted away, they left all of their weapons. Um, 
So they managed to capture a huge amount of weaponry that had just been supplied by the Americans. So ISIS right now are the most weaponized, the wealthiest terrorist organization in the world. I don't know how they got their arms in Syria. I was going to say that the, the, other, the other part of the equation is, is in Syria. Well, and again, I don't know the answer to that, but that, you know, there's a suggestion that you know, various Western powers have funded the anti-Assad uh, movement, which over time has become more extreme and morphed into what we now call ISIS. So there's, there's that possibility as well. But I think probably the, mo the more significant aspect is what Bayan said, is inheriting you know, heavy, heavy weaponry from Iraqi uh, military depots that were just um, left. Yes, question here. Uh, this question may sound a little simplistic after you've already given such complex answers, but I would like to hear a brief, um, you will briefly answer this. What would you say to the people, and many of whom I've heard make this statement, um, that Bush and Blair um, are largely responsible for the rise of ISIS? Um, I don't think so. Um, Iraq is a complex country. I, I said already it should really never have been created in that way. Um, the Iraqis who look back romantically over the monarchy or the, the 50s, I think they're living in another world. There may have been an, an elite group in Baghdad who were all intellectuals and, and bonded through culture. But the Iraqi population has always been Shia, Sunni, Kurd, and as uh, Justin has said, there were Jews and there still are some Christians as well. Um, we've always been a divided country. Uh, maybe, as I said, the elite or the aristocracy managed to bridge that gap briefly. I personally think, considering there was genocide in Kurdistan under Saddam and before Saddam, Saddam Hussein went to war with Iran, uh, 800,000 to a million people died in the Iran-Iraq war. I don't know how many died in Kuwait. Saddam was responsible for many deaths. So removing him from power was the right thing to do. What happened afterwards, there were many mistakes. I think Paul Bremer was very bad news. Uh, he tried to disband the Peshmerga. And I'd love to ask him today, what would you have done with ISIS attacking us if the Peshmerga didn't exist? So a lot of mistakes were made after the liberation, but I think, in my opinion, the liberation was right. And when people talk about Iraq as a disaster over the last 10 years, they fail to mention that Kurdistan region has been extremely successful. We have built the foundations of democracy. We have uh, built a, an oil sector from scratch after a century of the oil sector being completely neglected. We have businesses, we're doing business with Britain, with Turkey, who used to hate us, now we're allies with Turkey. There are some successes in Iraq. Of course, today we can't really see them, but I think blaming Bush and Blair for everything is not right. The Sunni-Shia conflict is centuries old, and it'll continue. Briefly, Justin, is it Bush and Blair's fault? Um, I would, the first thing I'd say would be there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq before Saddam was removed from power. It didn't exist. Saddam didn't tolerate it. Iraq was a secular state. We haven't really talked about women's rights. Women's rights in Iraq have, have suffered terribly um, after Saddam's removal as well. Uh, I'm not going to sit here as, as, a, as a Saddam apologist because he was, he was brutal, and I agree with um, Bayan that he was best removed. But I do think Bush and Blair bear enormous responsibility for the chaos um, that has ensued in Iraq since 2003. And it goes back to, I think, that line from General Colin Powell, you know, if you break it, you own it. We have owned Iraq, um, morally speaking, for a number of years after the invasion, and, and look what a disaster we've made of it. And I think we are part of the problem, um, and that is uh, uh, one of the reasons I will have great hesitation in saying, let's get, intervene again and help the Kurds um, in their desperate plight. Are we going to make it better? Are we just going to create a stronger, more powerful, more mobile, more dynamic, more flexible latest incarnation of Al-Qaeda, because that's the way it seems to be going at the moment. Okay, we have to draw it to a close there. Sorry if you've had your hand up and I haven't been able to get to you. Are you going to be signing books, Justin? I'd love to, yes. Uh, are right? they, they may also be drastically reduced. <laughs> Justin is going to sign books, but uh, thanks very much to you. Thanks for coming, and please give a very warm thanks to Brian and Justin. Thank you.